So welcome everyone. This is House Ways and Means. It's um, March 10th, Thursday, and it's Thursday morning. So we're going to be talking about education, finance, restructuring. Um, as has been our practice this session, I'm going to turn things over to Emily to run the meeting. Um, and we have two hours um, of uh, testimony and conversation uh, on education finance at 11. We'll take a break at 11 and at 11 15. Actually, we'll leave one and some one probably. At 11 15, we're going to go back to the H716, which is the bill we spent quite a lot of time on the last couple of days on the at 173 transition. And my hope is to have that voted um, just to let people know. So we should have enough information to do that. Um, so, um, I guess that's it. Any questions or announcements anyone has before we get going? Okay, Emily. Thanks. Um, morning, everyone. So, last, right before the break, we sort of went through the original recommendations of the task force and everyone flagged their questions. And so today, I think it's sort of a stack of some answers. Um, it's probably the easiest way to explain it. And so, um, have Anor here to talk to us about how we measure poverty and what that, how that sort of interacts with um, food assistance programs. And so Anor would love, um, and so we're gonna have Anor talk about that. And then Brad and Julia are gonna talk about tuitioning and how that is calculated and how it impacts budgets. Um, and then at, we're gonna take a break. And then at 10, Professor Colby is gonna come in to answer a few more of our technical questions. Um, and so looking forward to that. And with that, Anor, the floor is yours. Do we have documents from you? Um, you do, but I sent them late yesterday afternoon. So apologies for that. Um, but you do have um, some detailed kind of stats and data from me about the two main points that I'm going to make. Um, and so good morning, everyone. I'm Anor Horton. I'm the executive director of Hunger Free Vermont. And my understanding is that I have been asked to come in and speak with you this morning about sections four and five of the, I'm not sure what we're actually calling this bill. The pupil waiting bill is what I'm going to call it for a shorthand. Uh, this morning. Um, and so I really would like to um, just make sure that I am available today to answer all of your questions about the two key um, changes that are made in sections four and five of this bill. And one and is... Anor, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to... Um... Awkwardly enough, we actually don't have a bill and we're not looking at a bill because oh, okay. it's still over in the Senate. And so I we're see. really just talking about the recommendations of the move to free and reduce lunch and then the move to the- I understand. Less than the language. Okay. Um, reason for those ideas. So I Great. think they're probably identical. I just want to sort of give you a technical update. Thank you so much, Representative yes. Kornheiser. Okay, so yes, so um, I would just really like to be available this morning to answer um, any and all of your questions about um, how we move, uh, how we uh, currently measure uh, low-income students or students living in poverty or economically disadvantaged students, um, and um, also a, a kind of better way to, to capture that data with a universal income declaration form. So um, I'll just summarize my two main points and then I'd like to just, um, you know, we take any questions that you might have and I'm happy to elaborate on anything. So the first point um, that I really would like to make this morning is that um, there's a couple of different ways that the state of Vermont and in fact, all states in the United States um, use to measure um, students in poverty or low-income students. And one is um, household enrollment in Three Squares Vermont or SNAP. And the other is um, the student enrollment in the free and reduced price school meal program at their school. 
And the most common of these is the free and reduced priced meal application. Um, and both of these methods um, pretty significantly undercount the number of students who are low income or who are living in economically disadvantaged households. And so um, we at Hunger Free Vermont have been advocating for a long time um, to disconnect the way that the state of Vermont accounts for um, which students are economically disadvantaged for purposes of providing education support um, from these nutrition programs. And that the reason why these nutrition programs undercount the number of students who um, we could define as low income is that um, both these programs require the parents or guardians of these students to actively apply for and be accepted into a, a nutrition benefit program, either Three Squares Vermont or School Meals. And um, that is up to the individual parent or guardian to make that choice about whether or not to apply for these programs. Um, these programs have um, application processes that are pretty um, intrusive and complicated. And um, many families for many different reasons uh, choose not to apply or are not able to correctly make it through the application process in order to apply. And in addition, these nutrition programs are federal programs and the income cutoff for the programs and the rules around who qualifies for them are set by the federal government and the state of Vermont doesn't have any control over that. And so many uh, families may in fact um, count as low income or be experiencing low incomes and yet not qualify for the program. Um, so there, those are all the reasons why these programs um, undercount the number of students who um, are low income or economically disadvantaged. And so um, what that means for education funding right now is that um, the state of Vermont and school districts in Vermont are actually leaving federal dollars on the table, and I'm not talking about school meal program dollars now, I'm talking about education support dollars. Um, they're leaving those dollars in DC instead of fully being able to draw them down and make use of them the way they're intended, uh, either to provide supports for individual students, like um, not, not having to pay to take the PSAT or the SAT, or not having to pay to apply for college or um, tutoring support that might be um, supported by federal dollars but need to be uh, applied to individual students. So those, those kinds of individual student support programs are underused and underfunded because of this um, connection to these nutrition program applications, but also, um, dollars uh, to be used school-wide to support um, low-income students are um, also being uh, not drawn down to the extent that they could be. So that is uh, my first point. And I'd be happy to talk more about this uh, phenomenon of undercounting students yeah. by tying it to the federal programs. Uh, Nora, just a quick question while we're, while we're on the last point that you made. Would Changing, would, would moving ultimately to the universal form uh, affect our affect school districts eligibility for that kind of federal money that you were just talking about, or it, are they going to continue yeah. to use another one of the other measures? Yeah, that that is a critical question, and the answer is um, yes. The universal declaration form um, could be used to um, draw down, to document 
um, and draw down all of that education um, support money from the federal government, both for individual students and for um, school-wide programs. So, um, and, and I can answer that with 100% confidence because um, at the request of the pupil waiting task force, um, I did a lot of research on this question. Um, I spoke to people at the US Department of Education. I worked with a national organization, the Food Research and Action Center. I um, reached out to other states and collected examples of the kinds of universal income declaration forms that they use um, to see the range of the kinds of forms that are permitted by the, by the US Department of Education. And so um, I know for, for certain that um, the kind of form that we're talking about and envisioning here can be used to access all of those different kinds of federal education funding for schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, what are the differences in forms in different states? I'm just curious about that. Um, well, I can send you um, later today uh, samples of those forms, um, but uh, the really good news about this form, from my perspective, is that it can be very, very simple. So I don't know how many of you have ever seen a school meal program application form, but it is very complicated. It requires families to list every single source of income that they receive. It requires them to sign an attestation that they understand that they could get in terrible trouble for fraud if they're not telling the truth on this form. It has teeny tiny print um, and it's very, very complicated and confusing. And this is one of the reasons why many families either don't fill it out at all, fill it out incorrectly. Um, you can imagine what it would be like for a a uh, parent who um, does not, who's, for whom English is not their first language and they may not read well in English to try to fill out this form. So um, all of that, uh, none of that has to happen with this universal income declaration form because all of that is required for the meal program under USDA rules, but none of it is required under the US Department of Education to draw down the federal education dollars. All that has to be on that form as far as the US Department of Education is concerned is um, a list of the students, the children in the household, a number of the number of people in the household, uh, the names of the students so that you can reach them with individual um, educational supports. And you can uh, just an income range that families can check a box, that this is, this is the range in which my, our household income falls and you're done. So I think that we can solve a lot of problems in Vermont um, by adopting this kind of a form that um, the stigma is a lot less, the difficulty in completing it is a lot less. The other reason why the stigma um, is a lot less in addition to the fact that families are not asking for an individual benefit by completing this form, right? They're, it's not tied to a school meal. It's not tied to Three Squares Vermont. It's not tied to anything. It's, it's tied to helping the whole school community um, receive all the funds that it's entitled to. And um, while federal law prohibits the state of Vermont or a school district from requiring families to complete a school meal application, uh, federal law permits the, a school district to require every family to complete this universal income declaration form. And that means that instead of only families in need filling out this form, every family can fill out this form just as part of enrolling their student in school every year and we're going to get a much more accurate count of how many uh, pupils are 
in each school in Vermont who are actually meet whatever criteria is set by the legislature for defining them as economically disadvantaged. So um, I think it's going to it's going to solve a lot of problems that <laughs> our schools have right now with drawing down all the federal funds they're entitled to. And also it's going to assist the state of Vermont a great deal in determining how to distribute state education funding to particular categories of students. Uh, Hi, Inara. Um, so a question, you, you said that uh, school districts can require that all of the parents of all of their students fill out this universal declaration form. Um, what happens if a parent won't fill out a declaration? Do they have the power to say, sorry, your child can't, can't come to school until you fill this out, or how far does that go? Mm -hmm. Well, so technically, they, they may have that power. I, I, I'm not going to speak for any school district, but I, you know, we, they probably wouldn't enforce that. But I think that here's what we know from schools in Vermont who already use this kind of form. So schools that are providing um, universal meals under the community el eligibility provision um, already have to use what's called the household income form. In, uh, that's what the Agency of Education calls this form right now. Um, and this form is more complicated than it needs to be according to federal law. So I think we could make the form better and simpler. But we already have school districts and individual schools in Vermont who use this form. And um, we've, we've, you know, I've spoken with several principals from schools and the, they've developed some pretty um, effective and sophisticated methods of making sure that they collect these forms from all or nearly all families. And what they find is that just telling people this, this is what we need in order to make sure we get all the education funding, please help us out, um, is a pretty effective appeal, actually. And many schools, um, you know, are, are successful in collecting a very high percentage of these forms, much higher percentage than, um, you know, you're still, you're still getting a much better picture of how many students in your schools are at what income levels by, ask, by, by requiring all families to complete the form than you are by taking whatever you get from the school meal application collection, which is what's Hi. happening. Hi, Anora. Um, uh, what kinds of things do the, do the principal or the school nurse, who, who's working on getting these forms out? Who's working on getting them back? What happens when English is not the primary language? What happens with the people who are not very connected to getting forms back? How many hours does it take per form to get back, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, um, I'm pro I may not be the best person to really precisely answer all those questions since I don't, I'm not working in a school, but um, the, the one, one, the first important thing to understand is that schools do all of that to get school meal applications back. Now, it's hard to get school meal applications back and it takes a lot of time and effort. And then the processing of those forms is incredibly time consuming because somebody at the school has to actually do the math of adding up everybody's, all this list of different kinds of income people get and making that determination as opposed to noting this is the box that got checked for this income range. So, so it's incredibly time intensive to collect school meal applications. This, this income form would be much simpler. We could make it as a state, we could make it much simpler. And um, I think that what works well for forms like this, um, what are best practices is you know, you, you might include it along with the other forms that are mandatory. So you, so every, every parent or guardian must fill out an emergency contact information form for their students. They must 
sign permissions for their students to participate in sports. There's all kinds of things that they have to complete. And if this pretty simple form is included in that list, um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to collect quite a few of them, probably the majority that way. Um, schools right now, best practice for school meal applications is to send the meal application separately in the mail over the summer with a return stamped envelope um, to um, encourage families to complete it. So schools could continue to do that with this universal income declaration form if they wanted to. Um, your question about what we do about families who, um, for whom English is not their first language or who have other challenges with completing the form, that's a challenge that we face now um, as well with school forms. And um, so, you know, ideally, um, we would have this form be uh, translated into many different languages and um, we, would, we would make it as easy as possible for families to complete it. But right now we have that challenge, schools have that challenge with all the forms that they need families to complete. And um, so I assume that they would use similar methods to collect this form. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I wonder if, uh, I, I just wonder if we could hear from maybe Winooski who, who has experience with trying to collect the forms and what kind of people power it takes to do it. And, and am I right that Winooski and Burlington both already use universal income declaration forms? Yes, that's correct. So yeah, that would be great. Um, George, you had a question and then we're gonna um, wrap up pretty soon after that. Okay. Hi, George Tilton Jericho. I wasn't here when we introduced ourselves. Um, first of all, thank you for all your work on this and thank you to the task force for taking this up. It's been a long time frustration for me um, to uh, uh, seeing the undercounting in our communities of, of poverty. Um, I have a couple quick questions. First of all, who has who is the keeper of this information and who has access to it? And, um, you know, for some folks, it might be sensitive information. How do we, how do we guarantee the confidentiality of this? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so there are a lot of um, strict rules in place around school meal applications and information, uh, what we call direct certification information, uh, which schools receive from uh, the Department for Children and Families about which families are enrolled in Three Squares Vermont and Reach Up and um, other programs that automatically qualify their children to receive free school meals. So, um, there are careful protocols in place. Only certain people um, have access to that information. And um, I, I, I expect that a similar kinds of protocols could be implemented for this form um, and should be because it is sensitive information. I think that, um, I think what's most sensitive about the information right now is are things that could be eliminated on this form. Because on the school meal application right now, families have to write in, you know, this income is from child support payments. This income is for this temporary job. This income is from this other thing. And they have to disclose a lot of really personal information about how they get their money. And that this, this form, this un, a universal income declaration form could just be a box that a family would check to say, um, the, our household income is under this number or it's over this number or it's in this income range. And that would be the only information that they would be providing. And so um, I think the form itself could mitigate a lot of that of the concern because their families just wouldn't have to disclose as much information. 
Um, yep. But it, that still, there should be protocols, and every school district already has them for how they handle the the, the many different kinds of sensitive in, information that families are providing them already about their students, their students' health needs, their students' food allergies. There's a lot of of private information. And then, that families and then I think we're also going to need to talk to Brad and some other data people at AOE about how they get it from school districts, because I think there's some questions about sort of underreporting in some districts as well. And then the other question? part of my question was, um, I assume in what's proposed there is a exception or carve out for things like state place students or foster kids, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Is that, am I correct that there is an exception for those sorts of things? Those are usually, yes. I'm not sure if in the existing bill, but I think that's sort of standard protocol with state place students to have a specific, or specifically named. In one of the versions of the bill I saw, that was true. And, and if I might add to that, so um, this, there's a group of students, there's some, there are several groups of students where um, information about whether or not they count as low income students is automatically provided to schools through a private um, electronic means by the Department for Children and Families and um, state placed foster care children are part of that group. Um, migrant children who are identified um, are part of that group. Um, students, as I said before, whose families receive Three Squares Vermont and students whose families receive Reach Up. Schools will continue to receive that information um, through a secure electronic channel, um, regardless of what happens with this particular form. So it, that doesn't answer it for all students because some, some groups of students are identified at the school district level. So students who are homeless um, and, um, and in some cases students who are migrant are um, the homeless liaison for the school district is the person who collects that information and provides it to uh, the school. So things, it's a little different depending on what group of students we're talking about, how that information is handled now. Bridge, was that all your, I can't see your face. Okay, good. Scott, did you have a question or did I? Just one, I just said quick one. So Nora, my, my biggest concern with our existing system is that we have a huge variation of uptake rates around the state, both for SNAP and for FRL. Is it your opinion that just moving the universal declaration would solve that problem? I believe that it really would go a long, long way to solving that problem. And you're absolutely right. We um, our rural school districts, I believe our higher income school districts are the ones where the undercounting is more significant uh, of our low income students. And therefore those school districts and those students are actually at a great disadvantage for receiving a lot of the supports that are tied to income. And I believe that moving to a universal income declaration form um, would really make a huge difference for all our students everywhere and all our families everywhere, but especially for low income students and families who are in rural districts, small schools, where everybody knows your business, and also um, higher income districts where you're a smaller group of this overall student population. Thank you. Thank you, Anor. Um, I think we need to transition. So wondering if you have sort of anything final you wanna add, really appreciate you spending this time with us um, and all the thought you've given to this issue. Um, I, it is my absolute pleasure. I can't tell you how excited I am that the legislature is taking up this question. And I believe that we can um, really make a tremendous difference um, and a tremendous impact through the work that you're doing on this really complicated process. So I would like to thank all of you and I will provide the committee with some additional, um, more kind of technical information about the, um, federal government rules around this form and um, some samples of the form from other states. I would like to say that I think it's really important 
that this form is designed with great care and thought should the form be enacted, um, that we really need to take the time with the agency of education to develop a form that uses every possible best practice that's as easy as possible for families to complete, that is translated into multiple languages, ideally that has a web-based version that families can complete, um, you know, we could really um, transform the way that, um, that school districts are able to identify and help low-income students without um, the degree of stigma and shame that is attached to that now. And um, that would be an amazing accomplishment. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, so I think next up, we're gonna hear from Brad. And Brad, before you jump into tuitioning, um, am I correct that sort of the way we measure poverty has also a big impact on the edge fund because of the federal dollars that we draw down based on how many kids we're counting? So ESSER, for example, <laughs> was based on those numbers? Um, Brad James, Agency of Education. Yes, es ESSER was based, uh, ESSER dollars were based on how Title I is allocated, which is, it is itself based on poverty counts from uh, the school districts. So in, in that sense, yes, the, the monies that came in, um, well, I'm trying to remember how the total amount for Vermont was done. Um, I know that the amount we got, it was allocated out to supervisory unions based on the, the Title I allocations. Um, I think, I don't remember off the top of my head how at the, the, the initial ESSER amount or any of the ESSER amounts were determined that came to individual states. There might, for all I know, there might've been a small state minimum like there was in Title I. I don't, I, I don't know, I, I can find out for you though. Um, and with that, Totally shifting gears. <laughs> okay, so so I, I'm going to give you kind of a brief overview of, of what's happening with tuition, um, just kind of a high level. Um, I have one handout for you today. I believe it's called tuition overview, and as Monty Python said, now for something completely different because. It's not numbers. Um, it's actually words this time around. <laughs> Can you do this, Brad? I, no, I'm having. I, I want to. I struggled with this. I, I really did. I struggled. <laughs> but but it's like, oh my God, there are words on the page. What do I do? Um, so anyway, here here we are. So um, so I I think I think the, the the first real question that that we need to talk about is is what is announced tuition because that's what everybody hears about. They hear about announced tuition. They hear about average announced tuition, and. Announced tuition is basically what a school district thinks it's going to cost to educate one of its students for the upcoming year. And that's what they're, that's what they're calculated and determining. That's what they're setting as a tuition rate. Um, I'm not going to necessarily follow what I have written in order because I don't do those things very well. Um, and I certainly am not going to read it to you. Um, so School districts have to announce their tuition by January 15th. If they don't, then the prior years, or the current year, I guess I should say, tuition rate is used for the following year. The same holds true for independent schools. They have to announce their tuition too. The boards, their trustee boards have to announce theirs and they have the same date in there. Um, so the, the announced tuition then is collected by us. How is it determined? There's no guide, there are no guidelines for how it's determined. Basically, what the law says is that a school district should not set a tuition rate that is higher than what it costs their resident students. So that that's, I mean, it's it's more complex than that, but that's that's what it boils down to. So that's what school districts are trying to do. There's no guide saying you use this, you use this, you do this. It's it's the school districts do it themselves. Um, once those announced tuitions are done, uh, there there is a there is a, an, a true up the following year based on actual inf information. So if, if they announce a tuition of $20,000 for this coming year, the year happens, the school districts pay who are sending kids, but then the, the final numbers come out and say, well, it was really $17,000, then there's a true up. Conversely, if they did it low, there's a true up if it goes high too. So, so that, that's a statute. That's called the maximum allowable tuition rate. And, but that happens the following year of that true up. Um, 
So the next thing that's probably critical to know about is what's called the average announced tuition. And that's the one that, that the independent schools really pay attention to who don't set their own rates. And we'll come to those of it shortly. Um, the average announced tuition is broken up into two sets, one for elementary grades K through six, and one for secondary grades seven through 12. And, and it may be nine, 12, maybe seven, 12, what, whatever the case may be, seven, eight. Um, <clears throat> What the, the average announced tuition for elementary schools is, is it is the average of all the union elementary school districts in the state for that year. And that's, that's what comes out to be the average union, average announced tuition for union elementary schools. By the same token for secondary schools, it's the average announced tuition for all the union school districts, grades seven through 12 or nine through 12, whichever the case may be, or seven, eight in some cases. So I, I gave you under two, a very quick, um, look at what, what the announced tuitions are. I meant to put in percentage changes, I forgot. Um, but here's five years of what they are. So the average announced tuition, AAT is my abbreviation for average announced tuition. Average announced tuition for the Union Elementary Schools in, 19, in FY19 was just, just over $13,900. For this coming school year, it's up to just over $16,000. And for Union High School districts, did I type that incorrectly? That looks funny. Let me check my notes. Um, so on your on your piece of paper where it says average announced tuition for Union High Schools, where it says twelve thousand six hundred eighteen, make that fifteen thousand six hundred eighteen. I apologize. <laughs> that happens when I do things quickly. See, the, the, the numbers I can I can confuse, you know. So so, so that twelve thousand six one eight should be fifteen thousand six one eight. I apologize for that. Um, so it went from 15,618 to FY 23 for the school year next year to just about $17,300. So that's just kind of giving you an indication of what's happening. So why are these numbers important? Because this is, this is the tuition rate that most independent school districts set. Okay, they, they use because they're allowed to go up to that level. And so that's where most of them set their tuition rates. Um, and we usually get lots of calls saying, what's the tuition rate from the independent schools? And we get it posted. Sometimes it's a little bit later than we anticipate, but we get it posted. And so these, these are the numbers. Okay. Um, so who do school districts pay their tuition to? Um, they pay tuitions. They they pay tuitions to public schools, either in state or out of state, or even out of country. I think they use it's not an out of country public school though. Um, they 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 pay tuition to approved independent schools in Vermont. They pay tuition to independent schools meeting education quality standards and. I think there might be two next year. I'm not sure, um, I, and I, I'm not. I'm never clear whether Thetford Academy is considered to be meeting education quality standards now or not. They were in the past. I don't know if they are now. And I believe Sharon Academy is working towards it and is going to be, presumed is not the correct word, but they're going to be meeting uh, school quality standards or education quality standards, I take that back, um, for this coming school year, provided they meet certain conditions. So there, there should be one or two districts that do that. And then in independent schools that are in other countries and other states, as long as they're meeting the, the laws that govern independent schools in those states or countries. And then tutorial programs offered, uh, approved by the state, Pro, state Board of Education. I think there are two. Um, and then approved and independent programs. And the ones I think of when I hear approved independent programs, I think the teen parent education centers, um, because those are the ones I'm more familiar with. There are probably a few others, but that's what I think of when I hear approved education program. So that's who school district can pay their tuition to. It's, it's again, it's prescribed in statute as to, as to what they're do, what they can do. Okay. Um, we're down on number four here. How much tuition does the school district pay to other districts? Um, it depends. <laughs> um, if there, if it's, it, it depends on if it's a, if it's to an independent school, if it's to a public school, it depends if it's an elementary school or a a secondary school. So it's for an, if it's for an elementary student grades six through eight, then they pay full tuition to a public school in or out of state. If it's to an improved independent school, they pay the lesser of three choices. They pay the lesser of the average announced tuition for union elementary schools. Or, or the actual tuition charged by the, the independent school, it's very rarely less than the average announced tuition, or they pay the 
average of what they're paying for all their other resident elementary school students that they're tuitioning. Okay, generally speaking, it's it's the average amount of tuition that people pay. Um, just just as, as what's going on, and then in terms of secondary students, like elementary, they pay full tuition to their secondary student for their secondary students to a public school, either in state or out of state. If you have independent schools functioning as an approved in, as an approved regional uh, cent, uh, career technical center, a CTE then they pay full tuition. That would be uh, Linden Institute and, and Thetford Academy together, not Thetford Academy, probably St. Johnsbury Academy. Um, together, they act as a regional technical center. So they get to charge their full tuition. If, they, if it is a independent school meeting school quality standards, then full tuition is paid. And I don't think I put this one on there. If, if it's a designated school, such as Thetford Academy, um, Thetford Academy is a designated school by the school district of Thetford and Stratford. Then they pay, then that acts as a public high school. So they get to pay, they get the full tuition is paid to them also. And other districts come in and also pay the same. And again, if Thetford Academy is meeting education quality standards, they get it in, in, from that aspect also. Yeah, yeah, okay. Brad, so if they're, if they're sending a kid to the CTE, but he's still getting basic education at his original school. Do they prorate that? Or does they go full tuition to the CTE? They, they, if, if the student is going to a CTE for say, let's say half time, they should be prorating it. Um, I, would, I would need to check to make sure that's what's happening, but I have the feeling that if that was not what was happening, I would, be, I would probably be hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then there is a provision for secondary students, not elementary students, but for secondary students, there is a provision that um, the receiving school district, the board of the receiving school district, the ones who tuition is paid to, can make a different agreement than, than what's in statute with sending districts. If they choose to do that, then they have to offer it to all school districts that are sending, not just a select few. So it's you can you can make that decision, but then it applies to everyone coming into the school district, not to not to individual parents or anything, but to the school districts that are sending their kids in. Um, a couple of quick examples of exceptions: um, Burn Burton, Burn Burton Academy charges less to school districts in their area who send most of their kids there. Uh, the voters in those school districts approve a higher tuition rate. They're allowed to do that. I forgot to mention that earlier. They approve a higher tuition rate, so they, they, they can ignore whatever the statute says because the voters have said, do we want to pay higher? So Burn Burton gives them a, a discount, and most, most of the students in that area tend to go to Burn Burton. Yeah, Brad, when that happens, is, does the way that look to a voter, is there like a second, um, a second article on their, their when they vote that is that how that I mean is it I, it, it's a good question, Representative Beck, and I don't know the answer because I don't, I haven't seen any of those warnings. I don't know if anybody on the committee, I think someone, I can't remember who on the committee um, is in that area. They, they may know, I, I don't. Um, okay, because our article one ballot language is pretty prescriptive. The, the article on ballot language is pretty prescriptive, um, but what it's what it's talking about is is it's talking about an amount. So my guess is, well, it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. I'm not even going to guess. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll look around and see if I can find a counter. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll check too. I I can usually find ballots online or warnings online. I'll make a note of that. Brad, when I. I'm sort of reading the process about there's sort of an average created and then people are maxing to that and then it's sort of a new average is created the next year. Does that sort of create an, an artificial inflationary effect on some level? No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it. I don't think it does because because the you know we're talking the independent schools kind of going to the max and you know that's logical. Um, yeah. Um, 
it, because it, it's coming from what the, what the public schools to think is going to be their cost. That's, that's really where it's coming from. The push is not okay. from the independent side. It's really from the public side and, and, and with their, all, all their inflationary factors and whatever it is that they're dealing with. So I, so I, don't, I don't think it's anything, an artificial increase or anything like that. I think it's you know, pretty much based on reality. Because again, as I said, there's that provision that says they sh that school districts should not do more than a tuition rate for incoming students more than what their residents are and mm -hmm. then there's that true up the following year you know if, if they over if they over over bill yeah over bill or under bill um then they get then they get to make up the difference up to a certain point and when you when districts are figuring that out um public districts are figuring that out and they're looking at the per pupil cost in order to sort of determine that. Do they, do you know if they use their equalized per pupil cost or their non equalized per pupil cost? Their the tu tuitions are built on actual people, on actual headcounts. Okay. Uh, so, so the enrollment, which differs from ADM and equalized pupils. So, I think they're probably what they're doing is they're probably figuring out what costs there are, and then they're using their enrollment counts. Is, is what I think is what I think they're. I I don't know for certain, but I'd be shocked if anybody's using their equalized pupil count, just because equalized pupils and enrollments can be significantly different, and yeah. e equalized pupils are at districts, enrollments are at schools, and this is kind of more to the school level. Um, no, I, I'm just, it's just a comment. I, I'm just trying to work through my head is, is that, you know, you have a system where, where voters can vote for more than the average announced. And it kind of almost makes me just try to try to get my head up. Like, what would happen if we just didn't even have average? Tuition? <laughs> like, would, would it be any different than what we have? Right? I, I don't know. I'm just trying to get my head around that. But well, I, 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 yeah, I, I understand. I, I think what, what the average announced tuition does is it, 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 it provides a target for both the independent schools, which, which they think is low, which I'm sure you've heard. Um, they, they, they think it's too low in most cases, but it pro provides a target for them and it provides an, uh, an idea of what's going to happen with some of the um, school districts who are paying those tuitions. One of the things I think I mentioned it the other day when I was in, when we were talking about why is education spending high, or it was on, at least it was on what I wrote down, um, was one school district said the, the tuition rates from the uh, independent schools they sent a lot of their kids to were much higher than they anticipated. They anticipated a good amount, but the, the cost came in higher. And so, you know, so, so I, I think if you took away average announced tuition, my guess is that independent school tuitions would increase, not necessarily everywhere, but my guess is that across the board, there'd be a general increase. Um, and so that would, that would be an increase in education spending. And if you did the opposite, which was say that everyone needs to stick to average announced tuition instead of all these confusing car votes. Um, then what would happen is I would, I think that, that um, the tuition rate for Burn Burton would go down. We're assuming the voters can't approve it at a higher amount. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then 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 the tuitions in the Burn Burton area would decrease to whatever the amount's tuition is, probably a couple thousand dollars less per student. Um, it would not impact St. John's Barrier Linden Institute because they act as a regional technical center, and it would not impact Thetford Academy because they are a designated high school, and I think they meet education quality standards. I'm not 100% sure on that, um, but one way or the other, they, they're, they're meeting. So really only impact Burr and Burden. Pretty much everybody else is at, the, there's, there's no option for them, or I'm trying to think. I don't think anybody is has voted to pay more to any schools other than Burr and Burton. I'm trying to think if they do for um, Long Trail or something. I don't think anybody has that I'm aware of. Um, so I, so I, th I think I think the impact would would be regional if, if this was if this was most other people are at the announced tuition average announced tuition levels really amazing how over they, they will charge the parents if they want to it's amazing how personal the policy can be in a small state um, Jim had a question and then David and well, then we're gonna take a break <laughs> a statement and a question Brad as you know um, Stratford's been charging the average but would like to charge more. They're finding their um, their uh, their budget a little tight. 
And I guess um, you know something about it. You and I have talked about this, Brad, but you said it's really someone else's office that's working on this um, issue. You, you, you said Strafford? Yeah, uh, Sharon Academy. Yeah, Sorry. okay. That's that's what I thought. I thought you meant Sharon, but I thought I heard you say Strafford. Just yeah, yeah, just, while we're, just while we're thinking of it, Strafford does have its own ish deal. But Sharon Academy, yes, Sharon Sharon Academy, um, because they talked about it last session with I think House Ed. Uh, we're trying. we is has been trying to meets education quality standards eqs um and i believe i believe that that i'm not sure it's finalized yet but i believe that they're going to move forward and and we're agreeing with them that that they will be meeting the education quality standards for this coming year the, i think i think and i'm not 100 sure on this representative Mad, Mad, uh, Madeline, but but i think they still need to do a few things or sign off on some things saying they will do it then we'll be checking um, that that's my understanding. I'm not 100% clear on it, but it but my understanding is that they will be considered presumed to meet education quality standards this following year. So they will be able to charge whatever you know they be able to receive whatever they they choose to charge. And for they won't be limited by the average announced yeah, charge. Thank you. For people in the room or around the table or anywhere, um, Sharon Academy offers an excellent education. It's Sort of more independent minded than, than the structures of um, public schools. Yeah. It was it David or George today? Hmm? David. Uh, yeah. Well, I just I pulled up the ballot article for the Taconic and Green District, which is the um, the merge district that includes uh, many many of the towns send their students to uh, Burn Burn. Okay. And I'll just read it. It's interesting. Uh, to your question, Scott, it's it, and it's not what I expected. Shall the voters approve payment of the of the announced tuition rate of Burn Burton Academy in the amount of nineteen thousand two hundred dollars for resident pupils in grades nine through twelve who attend any approved Vermont independent school? Mm. And there is no second. All right. They're basically saying that they could pay that amount of money to burn burden or any other independent school so it seems school. yeah yes but no more than that no more than that and, and it does say the announced tuition so it doesn't it doesn't seem to be suggesting it's a discount yeah my, my understanding is they've always been a discount but i but you but i don't know for a fact um but that has been my understanding for years and years and years um but yeah okay that, that's interesting yeah so so they could be paying nineteen thousand dollars to somebody who would ordinarily be getting the average announced tuition of what was it seventeen or something like that sixteen. Yeah. Mm. Um, Scott, and then we're gonna wrap. I think what's also really compli really complicates this conversation is the fact that um, special education is usually on top of this, mm -hmm. and so the dis the school districts when they do their have their uh, per pupil spending that special education spending that's not supported by a state grant gets rolled into their per pupil spending, but it's not, it's not part of the tuition that it gets paid. If the child refers to need special services, that's an amount of money on top of that, that complicates it. And then you also have this the phenomena where when school districts are capturing grant money, almost always, if not always, that grant money is for the purpose of operating their school which lowers, helps them to lower their per pupil spending, but then independent schools don't really have access to that money. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on in this, this whole thing. It's very complicated. There, there are, and in terms of the maximum tuition rate, the maximum allowable tuition that, that people reconcile against, they do back out special education costs from that calculation. Right. So, so my guess is they're probably not in the announced tuition because there's no. there's, there's a piece of excess spend or excess costs for special education that, that most of the right. schools pass on. Yeah. So yeah, that can mean special services. They're playing paying that announced tuition plus yeah. whatever that, <laughs> that cost is. Right. Thank you very much, Brad, for spending time with us again today. Um, I don't know if we're going to see you again later today, but maybe we'll I'll, see you tomorrow. Thank around, you. For around 11-ish, yes. Okay, great. Thank you all. And I'll probably listen in to Tammy. Okay. We're going to take a break until...